Hey now, it's time for another video from Wrestling's Greatest Moments. In 1975, a deadly plane crash nearly ended professional wrestling. What happened? What was the eerie omen that a wrestler experienced? The wrestlers involved? The other plane crash involving wrestlers that year? And the man some believe saved professional wrestling th through his heroics? Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments looks at the deadly plane crash that nearly ended wrestling. While we're preparing for liftoff, be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on a single video. In 1975, a group of wrestlers chartered a small airplane to cut down on travel time. At that time, enterprising wrestlers who didn't want to spend hours and hours driving hundreds of miles found that chartering a small airplane was an affordable option, much like when they carpooled with a group of wrestlers. Later that year, a second group of wrestlers would travel by air, with equally lethal results. But in the second case, the crash nearly finished professional wrestling. On February 20th, 1975, Mike McCord, who later became better known as Austin Idol, Gary Hart, aka Gary Williams, Buddy Colt, a.k.a. Ronald Reed, and Buddy Shane, a.k.a. Robert Schoenberger, were flying from Miami to Tampa Bay in a Cessna 182 when it crashed into Tampa Bay. Bobby Shane died in the plane from drowning. The other three men survived, but not without injury. Buddy Colt was forced to retire from the ring and transition into managing and then announcing. Gary Hart continued managing, but could no longer wrestle with pain afflicting him the rest of his life, while Mike McCord recovered from a crushed foot, eventually transforming into the territory era superstar, Austin Idol. Something good would come out of this tragic plane crash, however, as one of the victim's advice to another wrestler may have saved their career and possibly their life. What was that advice? Let's see. On October 4th, 1975, a yellow and white Cessna 310 left Charlotte carrying five passengers headed for a Jim Crockett promotion show at Wilmington's Legion Stadium. Aboard the flight were wrestlers Ric Flair, Tim Mr. Wrestling Woods, Johnny Valentine, and Bob Bruggers, along with David Crockett, the brother to promoter Jim Crockett Jr. Just like the earlier 1975 plane crash, the wrestler saw the flight as a chance to reduce the often tedious travel time. In his memoir, To Be the Man, Rick Flair recalled meeting Vietnam veteran Mike Farkas at a bar. Farkas informed Flair he was a pilot and proposed flying a bunch of wrestlers to their various shows. As Flair recalls it, the first wrestler I approached was Johnny Valentine. He liked the idea of commuting 45 minutes by air instead of 5 hours by car. If we loaded up the plane with 5 or 6 guys, it would only cost about $100 apiece. Unfortunately, as Flair would later note, no one investigated Farkas's credentials, a mistake that would lead to disastrous results for all those aboard the October crash. As detailed by John Malinero in the 2000 article, The Plane Crash at Chain Wrestling, as they approached the Wilmington Airport runway, the plane ran out of gas, cutting across several treetops and a utility pole before crashing to the ground. Why had the plane run out of gas? Molinero notes, the crash came about as a result of human error. The pilot, Vietnam veteran Joseph Michael Farkas, had trouble getting the plane off the ground in Charlotte because of the bulk of the wrestlers. He did not distribute the weight of the passengers in the plane properly and decided to dump fuel from the gas tank to lighten the load. Johnny Valentine was the first to notice that the plane had run out of gas. John got to looking over the gauge and said, gee, we're out of gas. And the pilot said, don't worry about that, my wing tanks are full. When they started sputtering and spinning, the pilot panicked and started screaming. John reached over and slapped him to try and bring him to. Had the guy not panicked, they could have landed safely. David Crockett would recall, at the time I was scared to death. I just remember as we started going across Cape Fear River, the engine started to fail. I remember leaning over trying to control my breathing. My wife had her first child two weeks before. I was trying to do Lamaze so I wouldn't get the wind knocked out of me and pass out. Because I knew if I'd passed out, I'd be deader than a doornail. I remember thinking, I've got all these wrestlers in front of me. If we crash in this water, I'll never get past them and get out. There'd be no way. The results were catastrophic. David Crockett recalled what happened before the plane crashed. We crashed about 100 yards short of the runway. We just missed a water tower from the prison camp which is there at the end of the runway. The pilot stalled it and hit a tree and luckily we didn't flip and turn upside down. We hit another tree and bounced off and nosedived into a railroad embankment. If we had gotten past the trees, we would have made the clearing right before the runway. With danger looming, everyone tried to prepare themselves for the crash. Mr. Wrestling recalled Austin Idol's account of the crash, learning from Idol's experience. Austin Idol did not have his shoes on on the plane, and it tore the bottoms of his feet down to the bone, and he nearly never wrestled again. When Austin Idol told me about that, that was the first thing that went through my mind. I didn't have any shoes on either. 
The pilot had a big briefcase with some airplane manuals in it. I grabbed that and put it under my feet because I didn't have time to get my shoes on. While Otto's advice came in handy for Woods, he, like everyone else aboard the flight, did not escape unscathed. Incredibly, there were no immediate fatalities, but the injuries were devastating. Mike Farkas. The plane's pilot suffered a serious head injury and entered a coma from which he never emerged. Farkas died roughly a year later. Johnny Valentine. Valentine was seriously injured and would never wrestle again due to his injuries. Bob Brugers. Bruger suffered a serious injury, and according to Ric Flair, Brugers might have continued wrestling, but he chose to take an insurance settlement and open a bar with some of the proceeds. David Crockett. David suffered several injuries, but returned to Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling. Ric Flair. Flair suffered a broken back and was told he might never wrestle again. Determined to defy the doctors, Flair recovered, with some believing Flair's rehabilitation transformed him into an even better wrestler as he ditched his heavy frame. Tim missed wrestling Woods. As mentioned, Woods was injured, but chose to leave the hospital in order to protect wrestling. He continued wrestling until retiring in 1983. Fans at the Legion Stadium attended the show, which was supposed to feature Wahoo McDaniel taking on Ric Flair and Johnny Valentine battling Tim Mr. Wrestling Woods. However, as fan Sean Hudson recalled in his story, published at the Mid-Atlantic Wrestling Gateway, the stadium was full, and the ring announcer came out just after I had heard the rumor that there'd been a crash. The show did not start late. The ring announcer was keeping kayfabe and said that there was a plane crash and Valentine and Flair were injured. He then went on to say that Tim Woods was lost and couldn't make it to the stadium on time. Why didn't the announcer mention Tim Woods was aboard the plane? As we'll see, Woods was working as a babyface, and his presence aboard a plane with a group of heels would have shattered the illusion that professional wrestling promoters worked tirelessly to preserve. Indeed, the crash impacted more than just the wrestlers. It sent Jim Crockett Jr. scrambling to get through the immediate crisis, a crisis that could have destroyed his business. While the plane crash forever impacted the lives of wrestlers Johnny Valentine and Bob Brugers, some wrestlers and fans believe the plane crash could have ruined Jim Crockett promotions and possibly the wrestling industry itself. It's not hyperbole to say that Tim Mr. Wrestling Woods' heroic sacrifice made the difference between the business being exposed and kayfabe being maintained. Although it may seem hard to believe, many professional wrestling fans in 1975 were firm believers in the realism of professional wrestling. Sure, there were fans who questioned whether some matches were predetermined, but promoters and wrestlers worked diligently to maintain the illusion of wrestling's unscripted nature. For example, baby faces generally dressed in one locker room, while heels dressed with their fellow heels. Similar arrangements were set up for traveling and even socializing. Many wrestlers even hid the business's work nature from their families. Promoters seemed to feel that protecting wrestling's work nature was essential to keeping themselves in business. While the case can be made that fans might not have cared as much as promoters thought, promoters had been working the fans for so long that there was no reason to buck the system. The WWF would acknowledge wrestling's predetermined nature over a decade later, only because it allowed them to avoid paying state athletic commissions. Thus, promoters dismissed any notion that professional wrestling was anything but a legitimate sport, regardless of how hard reporters pressed them or skeptical members of the public snubbed their noses at it. Perhaps the best example of kayfabe and the public's perception that wrestling was legitimate was when Wahoo McDaniel, who was friends with Ric Flair behind the scenes, despite being bitter rivals on air, visited Flair at the hospital. As reporter Mike Mooneyham tells it, Wahoo was one of the first guys to visit him in the hospital, and of course the hospital attendants were startled when they saw Wahoo. They tried to restrain him. They believed it was a real feud and that Wahoo was trying to break into the hospital to get at Rick because Wahoo was barging right through the security in his style and they thought they might have to call the police on him. Is it any surprise that Tim Woods went to extraordinary lengths to keep himself from being identified? Recall Woods was the only babyface wrestler on the plane, something which would have shocked fans when they believed the faces and heels were more than rivals, but lifelong enemies. The idea of a babyface riding with heels could have ruined Jim Crockett promotions and even all of wrestling. According to Ric Flair, even as he checked in the hospital, Tim was protecting the business. He identified himself by his given name, George Burrell Wooden and claimed to be a wrestling promoter. Because he wrestled under a mask, there was a possibility that no one would make the connection. Flair believes Woods checked himself into the hospital the next day to reduce the chance of anyone connecting George Wooden with Tim Woods. It took two people to help Woods get out of the hospital, and somehow the gutsy grappler made appearances at wrestling shows to dispel any rumors he was aboard the crash. Somehow, Woods made it into the ring two weeks later, working a short match against superstar Billy Graham. 
As far as Flair is concerned, Tim was more than Mr. Wrestling that day. He became the man who saved wrestling, Mid-Atlantic wrestling anyway. If Jim Crockett Promotions had gone out of business, the wrestling world would have been denied one of its prestige territories. Jim Crockett Promotions would introduce many fans to stars such as Ricky Steamboat, Roddy Piper, and especially Ric Flair, as they became key figures in the promotion. More importantly, Jim Crockett Promotions outlived other NWA territories as Vince McMahon expanded the WWF to a national level. If Jim Crockett Promotions collapsed in 1975, the wrestling world would have been much different. The case that the plane crash of 1975 could have destroyed the entire wrestling industry is harder to swallow. While the idea of a babyface traveling with heels could have damaged and perhaps even ruined Jim Crockett Promotions, it's unlikely other promotions would have suffered. Wrestling promoters were always savvy at protecting the business, and in all likelihood, they would have been able to convince their fans that their wrestling wasn't like Jim Crocker Promotions. Still, as bad as the plane crash was, it could have been even worse. Like any historical event, there are the inevitable what-if questions that come to mind. The first is what if the passenger list had been different? Veteran wrestler Wahoo McDaniel was originally going to take the flight, but circumstances forced him out. Likewise, promoter Jim Crockett Jr. Was, was supposed to fly to Wilmington, but came down with the flu, resulting in his brother David taking his place. What if Wahoo and or Jim were injured or killed? Jim Crockett Jr. wasn't aboard the flight, but what if he'd taken the flight? It had only been a short time since Crockett had taken over the business after his father's appointee was ousted following a scandal. There were some who felt Crockett wasn't up to the task of running the promotion, and who would have taken control if Crockett was knocked out of action? either temporarily or permanently. Wahoo McDaniel was arguably Jim Crockett Promotions' top babyface at the time, and an injury could have hurt the business. As wrestling fans know, few wrestlers are irreplaceable, but McDaniel's absence, either through injury or death, would have hurt the promotion while it sought out a new main event babyface. Another one of has to do with Ric Flair. Initially told that his injuries were so severe that he might never wrestle again, and if he did, it might take two years to recover, the Nature Boy possibly avoided a career-ending injury when he switched seats with Johnny Valentine. According to wrestling historian Mike Mooneyham, Flair was supposed to have been in Valentine's seat. He originally was in that seat next to the pilot, but Johnny said he was kind of scared to be up there. He said Flair kept whining until Johnny said, You get in the back, I'll sit up here in the front. So really, it could have changed the future of wrestling. Despite his injuries, Valentine reportedly never held any ill will towards Flair for switching seats. Flair was a rising star at the time, and while he wasn't Crockett's biggest star, he would eventually become the promotion's number one star, and later, the top star of the National Wrestling Alliance, becoming the last major star to tour the NWA's various territories as world champion. While it's likely that Jim Crockett Promotions would have succeeded without Flair, Flair played such a pivotal role in the promotion's success that it's equally likely that the promotion would have been just one of many other promotions to fall at the WWF during Vince McMahon's national expansion. Instead, Flair helped Jim Crockett Promotions thrive and provided an alternative to the WWF. Even though mismanagement and other factors eventually doomed Crockett before the promotion was sold to Ted Turner and renamed World Championship Wrestling. For many fans, Ric Flair epitomized the NWA style of professional wrestling, providing fans with a clear alternative to the cartoonish WWF and its champion Hulk Hogan. Without Flair, could the NWA and later JCP have stood out as such an alternative? Thankfully, JCP avoided many of these potential pitfalls, as Flair worked hard to rehabilitate himself and the promotion hid the breach of kayfabe thanks to Tim Wood's efforts. Looking at what happened, it's difficult to believe any damage caused by the breach of kayfabe would have extended past Jim Crockett promotions, and while the industry may have suffered a black eye, it would have recovered. However, the wrestling industry avoided many pitfalls as Jim Crockett Jr. and Wahoo McDaniel were not aboard the flight, and Ric Flair's reluctance to sit in the front likely saved his career, with the Nature Boy suffering a less serious injury. While disaster was avoided, the death of pilot Joseph Michael Farkas and wrestler Johnny Valentine's career-ending injury shouldn't be understated. What do you think of this harrowing event? Share your thoughts in the comments section and let us know if there's any videos you'd like wrestling's greatest moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, hit our notifications button, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and spread the good news about wrestling's greatest moments, the channel that celebrates the squared circle.